Tim Verden. Uh, we're going to uh, now move on to the concluding uh, session today, which is another panel discussion, and it's concerned with the logistical challenges in the delivery of large-scale infrastructure projects. Uh, so I'm going to invite back to the stage uh, Tim Verden, who has just presented. Uh, Jeff Godston, uh, who is Director of Infrastructure Services uh, for KEO. Serb Gurr, who you have met, uh, Proposal Project Leader for STFA. Uh, Mr. Tim Clark, uh, who is Program Director for Obermeyer, uh, Middle East. And James Duncan, uh, who is Director for All Project oper Operations uh, with Hill International. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay, thank you, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, we have three new faces uh, on, on the panel. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background uh, about uh, e each of those individuals. Uh, the first is uh, Tim Clark, who's Program Director for Obermeyer Mid Middle East. Um, Tim's background spans architecture, engineering, and education, and he has qualifications in all of these disciplines, uh, as well as in arbitration. He has worked in the public, private, and academic sectors, and has broad experience of practices in the UK, Germany, US, China, and Cameroon. He took on a variety of international work in Africa, Germany, and the US before coming into the rail sector with Atkins, initially in the UK, then in Dubai. Uh, Tim Clark is currently a project director with the Qatar Integrated Railways Project and the Deutsche Bahn International Team on the Doha Metro Project. He is responsible for, for providing technical and design support to the Doha Metro Project for Curail, and he was previously uh, Director of Architecture for the Construction Support Team responsible for the implementation of the Dubai Metro Red Line. Moving on to uh, Jeffrey uh, Gosden, uh, Director of Infrastructure Services, KEO Qatar. Uh, Jeffrey has been the Director of Infrastructure Services at KEO Qatar since 2008. He's a chartered engineer with more than 30 years experience in civil engineering in Australia, India, Scotland, Bulgaria, and in the Middle East. He has broad civil engineering experience with particular expertise in the management of multidisciplinary infrastructure development projects. He also has experience in project management, design, supervision, and contract management of all types of infrastructure projects, including residential developments, roads and highways, water transmission pipelines, water and sewage pumping stations, water reticulation, wastewater and water treatment plants, and industrial development and marine projects. And finally, uh, Mr. James Duncan, who is Operations Director and Country Manager for Hill International Doha. Uh, James Duncan is a highly experienced project and development manage management professional with over 31 years in the industry, spent in major projects worldwide and in particular the Middle East. As I said, he's currently cu Country Manager for Hill, Hill International, who are undertaking the PMC uh, for the Qatar Rail Green Line. Uh, James uh, has undertaken major roles at the most senior level for both clients and consultants uh, during his career. Uh, he was previously group head of projects and development for Eurotunnel PLC, who constructed the channel tunnel between the UK and France. He is familiar with the challenges of major infrastructure projects and their associated developments. So without further ado, I'll move on to the, the questions. Uh, there's a slight uh, change in format, so uh, we're running slightly late at the moment, so rather than ask uh, questions individually of each panel member, I will address, uh, I will address uh, one panel member with a specific question and the others can be invited to comment. So uh, starting off, uh, the first question is, the new Doha Interna International Airport is running behind schedule and the new Doha port will not open until 2016. Several newer and larger major infrastructure projects are to be executed concurrently. Do you feel that enough is being done to address logistical issues and social impacts? And I'd like to uh, pass that, put, this question, put this question to Jeffrey Godson of uh, KEO. Oh, thanks. Uh, <laughs> the uh, question of whether enough is being done is probably, there's never enough being done in, when you've got such a major expansion happening. I was pleased to hear from previously that the uh, British Council is starting to do something about education 
and the expansion of that. We've had major problems getting some people accepting positions here because the uh, American school is full, got a great waiting list, and you can't get people in, so people don't want to come. And there's going to be a great shortage of engineers um, that are required to deliver these major projects. So I think that uh, a lot more needs to be done on education and providing the education facilities for the uh, import potassium. We also have problems in um, getting staff. There's restrictions on certain um, nationalities in bringing, and so we're missing out on a lot of highly skilled engineers because they're of the wrong nationality. So I think some of those issues need to be addressed. Okay, th thank you, Jeff. Um, can I ask uh, James, uh, would you like to comment, please? I yeah, I, I would agree with Jeff. I think uh, many of our organisations share the same uh, problems and issues, particularly as we're recruiting uh, in uh, a very specialised sector, uh, for example, the railways. We're talking about people with uh, a lot of expertise. We're talking about uh, people who require a lot of uh, social infrastructure. And we're all fishing in a rather small pond. There's a lot going on at the same time. Uh, there's five railway lines. We're talking about increasing the population of Qatar by hundreds of thousands in a very short space of time. And this is going to create all sorts of social pressures, quite apart from the, uh, the <coughs> bricks and mortar logistical pressures of moving materials about. There are all the issues of moving the people about. Hundreds of thousands of labor moving on and off sites that are right in the center of the city uh, on a daily basis. So these are going to be big challenges. And it's going to take a lot of coordination between the various stakeholders to make sure that we don't bring the entire city to a grinding halt. Thank you, James. I can pass the question to Tim Clark of Aldermar. Yeah, pleasure to comment. Um, I agree entirely. We've got a tremendously uh, big demand for resources in a very limited uh, world here. And um, I think the, <laughs> the situation is analogous to uh, how it is going to work in the morning, you know, along the road with all these competing. Um, cars for a very small bit of highway and um, people are jumping in and breaking the rules and doing all sorts of things and, and this tends to happen in a, in a situation where that hasn't all been properly straightened out and um, of course we are in the, in the road infrastructure situation in a very restricted um, sort of situation because it's being improved but uh, in terms of logistic uh, supply of personnel I think there are a number of things to be done housing, uh, visa processing, and um, certainly the uh, skill base, and possibly skill sharing that needs to go on, because there's some projects that have duplicated skills, um, several layers doing the same thing. Stakeholder management, for example, is being done in uh, several different ways on, on highway and on, on rail projects here. And um, the, the coordination between those needs to be perhaps fast-tracked and streamlined a little bit. So it, it's really a matter of, of, of learning from that experience so far and, and quickly adapt, adapt, adapting the system. Thank you, Tim. Uh, Sarab, would you like to comment on the same? Well, yes. I was living in Qatar two years ago, then I moved back to Istanbul. And, and when I came back here for this meeting, I realized that as traffic is getting congested day by day in, the, in that two years, it's incredible. And I know that there are coming more projects, I mean, like the, the second and the third packages of the new Doha port and the metro stations and the, the, the lines as well. I understand the, the clients and the project managers are trying to keep the, the labor, the workforce needed for the projects as much as possible in the construction area, in the construction villages, but I mean, it's inevitable that in order to get those people into the social life that they need, they are going to be moving in and around in the city. So I'm afraid it's going to be more congested in the coming days. But I don't know if there's any kind of a measure to be taken or it's considered by the, the state authorities about this one. Um, I, I have no answer to that, but it's, uh, it's a, obviously a very pressing issue, which is uh, not, not going to go away. Um, and can I ask Tim Verden? Would you yeah, like I think we're all in the same boat, yes. actually. Yeah. I'm trying to recruit 10 senior guys a month. Now, I'm, I'm at 135, I'm trying to get up to 300. 
Some guys I've been looking for two years, and I haven't managed to attract them in two years, almost with unlimited salary, I've said, and I still can't find these guys to, to come here. So we've got some very specialist guys that we're trying to bring from around the world. Uh, the guys generally have got wives, they've got other jobs. Um, so now I've had to change my profile down to single guys, or to guys that uh, will fly in and out of Dubai, um, or to guys um, whose wives uh, don't, uh, are happy in this environment. So it's certainly changed the profile of the, the people we're hiring. And that, that's not healthy for me, and it's not healthy for us as a company. But we've got no option. And I, and I think the common theme here today is schooling. You know, I've had guys on waiting lists now for, for two years, unable to get their wives into school. Um, with the, uh, there was an issue here with the, what's happening in the Middle East. When we have certain people ready to go, if there is a problem with a country, all those visas get cancelled as well. So when I think I've got a pipeline of guy, guys coming in, something happens, all of a sudden those visas stop, um, and then I'm caught short again. So it's, it's a hell of a challenge, I have to say, trying to bring in quality resources uh, when you want them. Uh, I suspect that uh, we may actually have uh, covered the, the next question, uh, which is, what are the main problems uh, that you're encountering in putting together the right team in Qatar for major infrastructure projects? Uh, I think what's particularly interesting from the responses that we've just uh, had is that the social impact uh, is not necessarily what you may have in other parts of the world where the uh, native population uh, is, of course, a much larger percentage of the population as a whole. Um, so many of the social impacts that we're uh, discussing uh, at the moment are actually to do with the social impacts on the expatriate population, which actually makes up the bulk of the population. So it sounds like it's a, a particularly uh, difficult uh, issue to address and, and one which uh, is going to have to be addressed uh, quite quickly uh, in, the, in the next uh, couple of years, actually, um, if, we, if uh, Qatar is hoping to achieve these uh, goals. But I'll, I'll ask this question uh, anyway, uh, which is, uh, what are the main problems you're encountering in putting together the right team in Qatar for major infrastructure projects? Um, and can I address this one to uh, James Duncan, please? Yes, as you say, we've, we've, we've kind of covered it uh, already, but I, I agree with Tim. I think we're all very much in the same boat uh, in terms of resource. We've found that everybody is fishing in the same pond, particularly on the Qatar Rail projects, uh, as is to be expected. Uh, Tim has other issues on his port, but in the same way, he's seeking particular specialists. We have the same issues. I'm sure my colleagues at KEO do as well. Um, what, if, what is the answer to that? I don't know. I think perhaps as we progress through these programs, we're going to have to think a little bit more, as you were saying, about collaboration. I think we're going to have to see a little bit more uh, coordination in terms of resource and uh, minimize the amount of duplication that's going on at the moment. We have different companies mobilizing different teams, all to do similar roles. Uh, there may be some opportunities there. Uh, and we certainly have to address the issues of schooling and expatriate support because even the senior staff represent many thousands of people and there just isn't the i think we did a bit of maths on it and we worked out that the uh, the town needs another five thousand school places of an international standard mm. uh, and needs them very quickly and, and we don't really see that being addressed we see schools like the american school have plans to expand but uh, you know, the, this is going to make it harder and harder for us to bring the right people in, and uh, I would totally endorse everything that Tim has said at the end. Do you see uh, current uh, re requirements, uh, or uh, do you see uh, ob do you encounter obstacles when it comes to, for instance, uh, visa processing timescales? Uh, do you are there do you perceive issues with uh, NOCs, uh, etc.? Um, do these impact upon your ability to recruit? I think. Um, uh, you know, NOCs is always a touchy subject and you know, those of us who have worked around the region over the years have encountered similar issues in booms in Dubai and Abu Dhabi. Um, I think there has to be some level of collaboration and understanding between uh, the players within the industry to avoid poaching, to avoid standing on each other's toes. I think we do that informally to a certain extent anyway. In, in terms of visas, well, Qatar isn't as bad as uh, other theatres I've worked in. It's a lot easier than Saudi Arabia, for example. Uh, but we do, again, as, 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 as I think it was Tim was saying, uh, encounter some slightly shifting sands sometimes in terms of countries that may or may not be in and out of favour and 
increasing and decreasing block visas and so on and so forth. I think that's something that we can share with uh, the client stakeholders and that uh, I dare say can be addressed. Okay, th thank you, James. Um, I think we've, we've probably exhausted uh, that, that particular uh, issue. Uh, I'll move on to uh, our, our final question, uh, which is uh, what factors might impede successful delivery of major infrastructure, and is the current delivery strategy aligned with the needs of FIFA 2022 and the Qatar National Vision 2030? Now, that's an incredibly uh, broad question, but um, if uh, you're prepared to... Uh, Give a response, I'd be grateful. Uh, can I put that question to uh, Tim Clark from Obermeyer? That was very kind of you, thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> My apologies. Quite handy <laughs> having two Tims in the group, actually, but you, you missed the other one this time. Um, I think the uh, major challenge with uh, infrastructure projects is the interfaces they have with the existing surroundings, and we did hear earlier from Tangram about the fact that we start with the past. We start with what's there already, and we need to somehow stitch in huge impact projects. I mean, you're lucky, Tim, because your, your port is at the edge of town and not in the middle of anything particularly, and you're even reclaiming land, which is, which is great, and probably improving it. But um, on the metro, for example, and certainly in Dubai, uh, our biggest issue was uh, trying to stitch uh, each station, each, each route into the locality in a way that provided convenient access for, for people to the, to the infrastructure that was available. Um, and I think we are talking generally about access, we're just talking about traffic access into town. I mean, it's, it's, it's a nightmare for some people to get to school or work in, in the morning, and it shouldn't be like that. And, and we have a number of constraints working on us uh, to, to prevent us doing what we, what we want to do every day uh, because of that, uh, those bottlenecks. But I do think that the, the urban integration, if you like, and we do call it urban integration planning on the, on the Metro project, should be a, um, a major front on which we can, we can probably all co collaborate and actually it's, it's an important front in which uh, stakeholders too have a, a big say. Okay. Th th thank you, Tim. Um, actually, there is, there is uh, one further question. Uh, first of all, uh, would anyone like to, to add to uh, what yeah. Tim has just For said? For me, there's yeah. probably five factors here actually of impeding things. Um, firstly, I think it's the stakeholders. We've talked about that and just getting everyone on the same page and stakeholder changes. And as designers and consultants, we often get lost in the design process. Um, and it's taken us three years to get the design to a place where all the stakeholders are willing to sign off. So on things like stadiums, on the big facilities here, as soon as you go to the stakeholders and maintaining a program whilst trying to get their views, whilst trying to get the design right, uh, we're all in danger of trying to get a perfect design. You'll never get a perfect design. You've just got to keep going with the process of procurement, tendering, wherever those changes come. Uh, secondly, it's procurement. Um, once again, for those of us that live through the Abu Dhabi Dubai boom, uh, which started with lump sum and you get 50 bids and whatever, and eventually you ended up with three or four people coming to you, and eventually nobody would come to you. Um, and eventually you had to sort of form frameworks and agreements and if you were very unlucky, you just had to find a contractor and say, just come and work with me, we'll agree a profit and I'll pay whatever you need. And that's how it ended up in Abu Dhabi and Dubai once the boom really got going. And at the moment, we have a rigorous procurement process. For me, it's six to nine months to buy anything. You just can't do that. Uh, cut down that design, that procurement process, either with frameworks or partnerships, um, and don't get all the contractors fighting amongst each other try and get the work allocated in, in a better basis. Next there's sort of resources. Um, once again, we, we've got resources at the moment, but things like MEP resources in this sort of environment dry up incredibly quickly. There's very few large MEP contractors here. Once two or three of them go by the wayside with big billion dollar project, <coughs> that's the end of your MEP. And then it's building those, uh, bringing those resources in. And then it's human capital as well. Have we got the human capital that can deliver? So there's five major things there that will impede and are impeding every day. And so it's not just about one area, it's about attacking all five of those across the, the board. Thank you, Tim. Uh, Serbio Ngura, would you like to add? Well, I would say, in fact, as Tim mentioned in his presentation, no port, no FIFA 2022, right? Because 
As far as I understood, the ships are in queue in Messiah port and the ships are in queue in Doha port. So in order to have the aggregate, the rock material and any kind of imported material required for the construction, those facilities should, have, should be completed on time. And if they will be done on time, I don't think there will be kind of an bad impedance on the FIFA 2022 works. Thank, thank you, sir. Still, still a very ambitious program in terms of procurement of the stadium and the, the completion of the port. Uh, Jeff, yeah. would you? Um, I agree with Tim and uh, the comments he made. And in particular, I think the integration planning between the projects, which uh, the central planning office take care of, for instance, um, on the metro, all the uh, disposal is down on an area just uh, south of the airport. You're going to then have the um, new port starting up, so you're going to have all these trucks um, in a facing with each other. And it may be things like you can backload the trucks and have a washing facility for trucks so you don't contaminate material and actually get some synergy between movements to reduce the amount of traffic on the road. You know, and the questions are, are there enough trucks in Qatar to deliver these projects? The actual logistics of the equipment that's going to be needed, is there sufficient in here? And if it's not, are we going to be able to get it delivered? Um, I think they're major issues. There's monopoly of supply issues under specifications. Um, there's performance specifications for concrete, but there's also um, technical specifications for sand. But there's a very limited amount of sand that meets that specification available in cover. So we need to be looking at all of those issues, flexibility in specifications, new materials, new types of ways of doing things, and don't just be fixed on uh, the cutter specification as it currently stands. We need it all to be explored and looked at to open up the ideas for people to be able to deliver what they can do well from these contractors. Yes. Okay, thank, th thank you, Jeff. Um, I'll move on to the, the final question, um, which again, again is a general, uh, a, a general question. I'd, I'd like to put this one to James Duncan. Um, do you think that uh, political instability in other parts of the Middle East uh, have impacted or could impact upon Qatar's capacity to deliver the major programs? Yeah, well, that's a, a very good question, actually. We rarely consider the political impact when we're talking about trucks and, uh, and, and so on and so forth. But it does lead on a bit from Jeff's point that uh, we have to view what we're doing here within the context of what is available within the region. And we're all well aware of, of, of the strains that have been put on other major programs in terms of material supply. Is the politics per se going to impact on what we're doing? Probably not, but it may impact on our ability to source materials, for example, the major cement producers in the region, such as Egypt, the steel producers in the region, such as Turkey, uh, our ability to be flexible in terms of where we're sourcing uh, and procuring materials, which will, as you say, Jeff, have to be a lot more open if we're going to get all this done in, this, in the time frame available. Uh, it will limit people's options. Um, I'm not worried that the, you know, the tanks are going to come rolling across Saudi Arabia or anything like that, but I think it will have an indirect impact uh, in terms of that. It also may have an impact in terms of uh, human resource in terms of people's ability to obtain visas. If your embassies are shut down, you can't process. I, I, I worked fairly recently in Syria, for example. Um, we had terrible difficulties, and through the Egyptian revolution, processing people's uh, visas and uh, accreditations, attestations and things for other countries, such as Saudi Arabia and so on and so forth. So it does create all these kind of uh, issues, which all s slows the process down. So there, there, there may well be indirect impacts, yes. But thank you, James. That was a, a very good response. I must admit, the issue is uh, much broader than, than I had imagined, actually. Um, can, can I ask the same uh, to you, Tim? Yeah. Tim um, Burden, sorry. Really, it's, uh, for me, it's been about the visas, like I said. Uh, whenever we have a flare-up in a different country, it then becomes impossible. I, I used to work in Libya for a couple of years, and I had a great team of engineers, about 80 engineers there. And I've been trying to get some of those engineers across here, and it, I, it's almost been impossible, <coughs> I have to say. Uh, and once again, with Syrian engineers, um, I've struggled with them. So whenever there's something flaring up, all of a sudden there's a, there's a block on things, and everything comes to a halt. In general terms of resources, I don't think we've struggled in terms of any resources. 
coming from anything um, because of the arms race. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Jeff? Yeah, I, one of the things I think it does is for major companies is to consider the risk or force majeure on their contracts and what it does in terms of costing of their contracts because you know, if the, um, there's an uprising in Iran and it spills over then and you get a, a diplomatic call, get your people out of the country, there's no comeback on the insurance and it's virtually impossible to insure for. And so there's major risks um, that are probably major companies would be considering and how they cost for that in their projects. So I think it, politically these issues are going to have a cost impact on the region. Okay, thanks, Jeff. And uh, Tim, Tim Clark. Yeah, I agree entirely. It's, it's going to be a cost impact, I think, um, above all, um, because the Arab, Arab Spring, so-called, or whatever's happening now, um, was an unbudgeted commitment, really, for Qatar, because Qatar is very generous and, and, and understanding of its Arab neighbors and has, has uh, shared resources with them. And these resources are limited resources within the country. So we have possibly um, slowed down in cash flow, uh, possibly, um, we need to plan for, in a, in, a, in a situation where we have very demanding programs and fast projects, we may have to slow down some of them in order to get the payments synchronized with programs that are mm. achievable uh, in, all, in all sorts of uh, senses. So, so money, timing, um, and simultaneous procurement may all have an impact on reasonable pace of, of progress that we can make on all of these projects at once. And, Perhaps we need to revisit some of the some of the plans we've got for you know, the metro in one direction, port in another, the airport, all wanting to achieve the programs that they had in mind, but then with all these other competing um, labor and, and, and political uh, funding aspects, there may be some other um, realistic um, considerations that need to uh, modify those programs a little bit. Yeah, I, th I think that would be very high on the agenda for uh, a, a lot of people in the room and a, a lot of uh, consultants and cat contractors in Qatar. Um, can I pass, uh, pass the question on finally to Ser 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 Serlan Gurur? <clears throat> yes, I think there may be some kind of indirect effects to, to the construction works in Qatar, but I mean, since Qatar is a safe haven in this area, I don't think it's going to make a deep impact here because I mean, <clears throat> in the aspects of acquiring the visas or finding the teams, there may be some kind of problems from, for different countries, but I think making up teams is also possible uh, from the other resources. So I don't think the, the construction sector workers will be affected uh, badly for coming or not coming to Qatar because of the environment situation. If I could just add one more thing we, we've struggled with a little bit recently, that the more that's going on in the world, the more distractions there are for the Qatar leadership. Um, so we have struggled with the Qatar leadership being spread very thin around the world, which is, does distract people from the focus of delivery of the projects and the focus and the decision making. So the more that's going on, the more that's going on closer to the borders of Qatar, there obviously the more distractions there are towards solving those problems, uh, the less strength you have in the core decision-making capacity. Th th thank you, Tim. And I, I guess again, that spells out you know, the need for uh, uh, really uh, strong strategic partners uh, go going forward. Um, well, uh, I'd now like to uh, pass the microphone to the audience if you have any questions you'd like to ask of our panel. Uh, can, can you raise your hand? Yeah. Okay. Gentleman now, uh, watch this third, third row from the front. <coughs> we all we know that the logistics is a major uh, risk will be in the country. And it's not only the people we, are to we should talk about the material and the equipment and the storage areas. I don't know, يعني, can we suggest something like for the, uh, the, uh, the major stakeholder like Ashgal to have its own logistic plan on macro level, similar to the Qatar Rail and similarly to the FIFA. And somebody, يعني, a steering committee formed between all these uh, entities just to look at the logistic from macro level, not small level. Thank you. That's a, a very good question. Um, 
Tim Clark, uh, would you like to answer that question? Um, can, you, can you just summarize the gist of it, please? Um, well, I, I, guess, uh, I guess the gist of it is, uh, with all of these different uh, major infrastructure projects going on uh, across different sectors, uh, would it be a good idea, or is there a committee who is sitting centrally, who is overall coordinating authority uh, for each of, uh, to bring together all of those uh, efforts and, and coordinate them? Yeah, I, th I think that's, that's probably a, a task, another task that the Central Planning Office um, ought to be thinking about. And um, I know uh, from internal experience that uh, the Metro project is getting a lot of attention on logistics and um, has developed model approaches for handling uh, materials and transporting them. And there's a huge amount to, to move. That's, that's a huge problem. But um, Central Planning Office certainly would have a role. But I think there should be a collaborating forum in which the projects, the larger projects, should be um, vigorously coordinating on, um, <coughs> on logistics. I think that's done informally, such as events like this. But uh, we do have a, a, a dire need, I think, to, to get airport, port, and metro, and other projects, all and, and transportation projects generally, sitting down together around the same table to think about shared, you know, whatever it is, conveyor belts, or trucks, or, or, or holes in the ground that we have to fill up, and so that so that what you were seeking, Tim, uh, you know, that sort of place to put your, uh, your, expert, uh, your uh, excavation material could be achieved uh, more, more instantly. Yes, I think that's, that's a very important point. I think at the moment we have the central planning office. I'm not sure it's got enough teeth at the moment. I know they're doing a lot of studies, and we heard earlier doing recommendations. Recommendations don't really help us. We need decision makers, and I think that's probably the gentleman's point. Yes. We need a decision making body on logistics. And if I read informally, I read that as the Supreme Council uh, responsible for FISA, FIFA. And I think that's why it is called the Supreme Council, because it will govern the delivery of FIFA. How much of that logistics fits under them, I'm not quite sure, because I know they've got their own logistics people looking at that. And at the moment, there seems to be a bit of a conflict with the CPO and, and the Supreme Council. And yes, there needs to be one body that says, We've got the horsepower, we'll make the decisions, you give us the recommendations and get going. And we certainly don't have that, and it's going to take a period of time before that, that flushes out who's got the real horsepower to make decisions and make things move. Okay. Thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions? Okay, well, it uh, looks as though there are no further questions. Well, uh, with that, uh, I'd just like to uh, thank our a uh, team of panelists, uh, Tim Verdon, Jeff Gosden, Serb Serblin Gurer, Tim Clark, and James Duncan for their considered uh, responses. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. And uh, I, I think on that note, actually, it's uh, time, time uh, to draw the proceedings to a close. Um, we'd... Uh, Construction Week, uh, we would like to think that you've, uh, you know, gained uh, information, you've gained insight and, uh, you know, been provided with uh, new information this morning, uh, which will uh, help you uh, going forward in terms of uh, your approach to uh, participating or uh, procuring or tendering for some of these uh, large projects that are that are about to come out. Uh, a number of issues have been uh, discussed and uh, it's very difficult for me to, to sum up, but I guess some of the key issues or the key words that have come out today uh, are governance uh, and the impact that that has uh, on any uh, major program, uh, proper planning and delivery and the, uh, the need for effective communication uh, from top to bottom through the supply chain. The Olympic, uh, the Olympic uh, presentation was particularly good because it really did uh, look at things from a macro and a micro perspective, uh, not just uh, the procurement processes and uh, you know, the large scale uh, delivery uh, issues, but also the details such as wayfinding communications, uh, which all need to be in place well in advance of any of these major events. Um, a particular emphasis was also put on the need for stakeholder engagement and uh, more dialogue um, 
both in terms of project teams, but also uh, in terms of with uh, local institutions, uh, government uh, bodies, and indeed uh, stakeholders in the wider community. Um, in terms of infrastructure and uh, sustainable development, one of the themes that was really reinforced uh, was the whole notion that uh, ultimately for the you know, proper and prosperous uh, development of any city, uh, stakeholders that should not be left out are of course the citizens, the people themselves, because ultimately they are the ultimate stakeholders uh, in any city. Uh, so with that today, I'd like to thank all of our contributors for uh, giving a, a very holistic and well-rounded uh, set of presentations and uh, wish, you, wish you a good afternoon. Thank you.